This company is called Tiny Bop. We make apps for kids. Uh, they're educational apps on subjects that we think kids everywhere need to know about. So our apps are highly localized. We're in 59 languages and um, we sell around the world. We're making, we're making beautiful educational apps for kids and then we're making them for every kid in the world. Um, there's no limit to uh, no age limit or language limit that any kid can can dive into these apps and we want them to inspire the curiosity within them. I'd been in another company that was uh, working on the web and this was sort of mid-2000s and um, I knew when I left that company that the world was moving towards mobile. I wanted to do something in mobile. I didn't know what exactly. And uh, so I decided to put myself in a co-working space for a year and just work on ideas. And um, I was working on a whole bunch of ideas that had nothing to do with this. But I have two boys. And so um, my, for my kids, the, the iPhone and iPad were like their favorite toys. And I started looking very uh, closely at what they were consuming on the iPad. And mainly I was disappointed. I felt like a lot of the apps that they were, they were, uh, they were playing with were not as good as the best books. They were not as good as the sort of the best movies. Um, and so I really started this company with the idea that I wanted to put together artists and engineers to, to make uh, apps that were worthy of the curiosity of kids. I think that Raul's uh, very much an ideas guy. He had all the vision for the apps in terms of the concepts that he wanted to build. Uh, he's, he is very familiar with the world of children's books, children's apps, movies, music, and so he had a lot of familiar visual references and media references. In terms of building the team, uh, I'd, I'd come from another company and I'd worked with a bunch of smart people over there. Um, so the first couple of people that I worked with um, were either people that I had, I had, I had worked with at, at other companies um, or they were just people that I really admired. When I first started it was just Raul and Yanga and myself. Uh, we were working in this very small space all kind of huddled together. Um, and I think it is, it was January when I started, so it was also kind of cold <laughs> and a little bit drafty. Um, but we were um, very diligent about our work. Our roles at the time were slightly different from where they are now. Um, Roel actually did a lot of the production work, so there were a lot of cases where we were getting all this artwork and I needed it like slightly different or like cut up differently. Um, and he was actually doing a lot of the production work and he actually did a lot of the sound work as well. And then Youngna was kind of managing where all that time was going and making sure we were on track. I think of myself as like mission control. I'm overseeing and making sure that our products, which are our apps, are shipped on time and also thinking strategically about how we develop, produce, concept, and scope what those apps are going to be. So we're a, a startup, a pretty typical startup for uh, New York or San Francisco in that um, when you get VC funding, you're, you're giving away part of the company, you're giving away a percentage of the company. Um, how much a percentage you give away is, is sort of the, the deal that you make. Um, so we got that initial funding 
And raising a million dollars sounds like a lot, but like in New York City, like if you're paying salaries and have contract, it actually goes very quickly. So, um, so that got us to product. Our first product turned out to be a hit. Uh, it, it ended up being uh, uh, very well received and, and had a large number of downloads and was making money. And that led us to uh, an A round. So then we had investors coming to us um, instead of us going to them. Really, like our apps are about giving context so that children can ask questions and have conversations with parents. Like I don't believe that that apps um, should be uh, trying to teach didactically. I think that really what they should be doing is, is prompting questions and, and or inspiring curiosity. The way that we build our apps, you know, we want people to start being curious about the topics that we're teaching in them, um, and we want to encourage them to do more with that. So um, we build our apps, but we also build handbooks, and we want to um, encourage them to do activities. We want to encourage them to go to museums. Um, we want to support them in, in being curious individuals. I think we don't really start from a blank screen. All the things that we are building um, have been influenced by things that influenced us. So, for example, the first series of apps we're making is called the Explorers Library. Each app in this series covers a big subject, again, that we think that every kid needs to know about. So the first one was the human body. And when I was a kid, I loved those, those dictionaries that had, or encyclopedias, that had uh, the transparencies uh, of you know, the different layers of the body. So we started with that idea. That was literally the first idea when we were building this human body app. But then we said, okay, but you're on a, on a you know, device that has a camera in it. So like when you show the eye, we can turn on the camera, we can flip the image, we can show how it actually works um, without telling the child that that's how it works. We can just do it. Um, and then when we show the stomach, we can show that if you turn the device sideways that the water sloshes around in the stomach. Um, and so our hope is that, that the, the apps that we make really do feel native. They don't feel like they're translated from something else. That they're, they're um, the fruit in, in, our, in our human body app that we show, they look like emojis. Um, that you know, children are familiar with from, from texting. Um, all this stuff sort of makes it feel like it, it should live there. You know, it's not translated from, from some other media. We're a studio that uh, very much prides ourselves on design, so a lot of time the the app comes to me in this form where I need to break it down into these systems um, that make sense technologically. And um, a lot of times I am just architecting those systems to put in place. I think our big advantage is design. Um, so the company was really has very strong design roots. We work with really great designers and, and, and great artists. Um, so I think combining great design with depth and good engineering, um, we have our apps I think have a depth that, that is unusual in the App Store. A lot of the stuff we do here at Tiny Bob is try and reflect like real world, real world uh, models. So a lot of that is just looking at the problem we have at hand and identifying um, you know, how we can actually model that in the code and get the most realistic um, scenario as possible. So um, I know Robles talked a lot about, uh, we use physics in a lot of our simulations, so that's true. Uh, we try to attach like real world physics to as many things as we can. But we also have things behind um, that you don't really see or you can't really perceive that's driving these interactions. Um, for example, we have an app called Plants that um, we actually built like this whole weather system to model these like real world uh, scenarios of weather. I 
I think the big milestones uh, for the company were obviously the investment is, is really important. Um, but then just getting that first app out there, like really the core of the first app was built with like four people and a few contractors. Um, and so, you know, there's a lot of competition for good people. So we marketed ourselves with our products. So the hope was that if somebody saw uh, what we were making, they wanted to be part of that too. Um, and so I think just getting the first app that out there was a big milestone. The most stressful moments for me, I guess, are trying to figure out uh, timelines of things. So we're working on these very ambitious projects um, and there's always a lot and there's always a lot of artwork coming in. Um, trying to figure out, you know, the most essential part of the app um, that needs to get in is always a little bit stressful trying to figure that out. Um, I might add that also when it comes time to release the app is also very stressful because you want to have something that has no bugs, works perfectly, and you know that's never going to be a possibility. There's always going to be one thing that's just not quite right. So it's always very stressful. So our first app, The Human Body, was released in August of 2013. And so when we released it, our goal was to have um, 10,000 downloads in the first month. Um, and I think on the first day we had 8,000 downloads. Um, so it went much better than expected. Um, and then Apple took an interest in us and they uh, included us in a program that they have called Free App of the Week in which you give away your app, there's no money in, but you can greatly expand your user base. So um, we took part in that program. Within a week, uh, we had millions of downloads. Um, so now we had a much larger user base of, of people that were aware of us. We know that they love them, but we have to sell them to parents. Um, so uh, in our marketing, um, we talk to parents. We're not talking to children. Um, but in the apps themselves, we want kids to love them so that they're the ones asking the, the parents to buy the apps. And so as part of that, um, from the very beginning, we started with a very strong brand foundation. Um, so we have uh, some really great designers who created a whole brand system for us um, that allows us, we want every app to essentially be marketing for the next app. Um, and we hope that if we continue to do our job and build things that are really fun for kids and really high quality that parents like as well, that we build brand equity. We haven't really done paid marketing up until now. Um, we're starting to do it. We've done some experiments, but really just um, low-cost experiments to see if certain channels work like Facebook or Twitter, um, but we don't do advertisements um, and we don't serve ads in our apps. We're designing a new app right now and it talks about time and so uh, a lot of children at a certain age they only understand relative time. Something was a long time ago or something is like far in the future, but they don't understand absolute time. If you say 1800, it doesn't make sense. So we have to be very conscious of the, uh, the age that we're targeting. And we say six to eight is our, our sort of prime range. But in reality, children much younger and even children much older use the apps. Um, and we know that, we try to be conscious of that. Our apps are in about 30,000 schools worldwide, um, and we can tell that through this program called the Volume Purchasing Program that Apple has. So a lot of schools are able to buy large amounts of apps at a discount um, with one single button. Um, and then there are some teachers who bring their iPads to school, some schools that don't have technology, um, but, they're, but they're doing it on the side. So there is a range of experience with tech in schools, 
Um, but part of our mission is to provide our apps to schools for free um, to help close the digital divide and have kids who wouldn't have access to really high quality um, technology use our apps in, their, in the classroom. I think that having the education piece validates what we're doing because teachers can clearly see they can see the value of what we're doing they, with the human body. They can say, like, I teach this subject in class. This is an, an app that's really open-ended, and they can apply it in their classroom in a lot of different ways. Um, so I think that we'll always need teachers to advocate for us and to use it in their classroom. Um, but I think that parents and kids will always be our primary audience because, as I said, we want, we want teachers who can't afford apps um, or who can but just want access for a lot of a lot of their students. Uh, we want them to have it for free. So hopefully that's why the parents and, and kids can help support us there. So. I think the biggest challenge is uh, creating really high quality products at a, at a faster pace. Um, so in order for us to be successful as a company, like we built out a model based on uh, developing like four to six apps a year. And so building apps with the kind of depth that we have um, takes a lot of work and a lot of people and a lot of time. And um, doing that faster is hard. And so figuring out how to scale our processes so that we can be more efficient is, is our, our big challenge. I the challenge with what we do, well one is um, we don't cur currently collect a lot of analytics on our apps because we're so sensitive to the privacy of children and parents. And so not knowing exactly how people are using our apps um, and not being able to communicate with them directly is, is always a challenge because you just just want to talk to people and find out what they, what they think. Um, so that's definitely a challenge. And then Starting as a community person, my experience is definitely more uh, like social media and like non-paid marketing. But um, so that's always that's been a constant learning process of like, how do we drive people to to see the apps, to want to download them, and um, what's the story that we're telling, and and how do we get them to to see that our apps are really valuable. So it's a constant learning process. Like any company, we've made a lot of mistakes. Uh, I think uh, with the second app that we created, um, it's, it's this app called Plants, and it covers different biomes of the Earth. Um, and in that app, we did so much research for it, and we put so much into it, that it, it was tremendously long and expensive to make. Um, and a lot of the research, it was sort of impossible to, for it to actually come out in the app. Um, so being aware of, of our processes and the impact that they have on the final product is really important, of like finding the right balance. I think that we're learning with every app we build that uh, the process is always a little bit different. Uh, some of it depends on what the subject is, some of it depends on uh, who's on the team. So the first step is usually uh, just deciding what, what idea that we're trying to pursue. So what's our concept? So for the human body, we're picking this topic. Uh, we try and get an understanding, I think it always starts with a lot of research, trying to get an understanding of both you know, what we should show about that topic um, in terms of how deep should we go, what's the most important thing to showcase, um, and also uh, researching the market in terms of who else is making apps in this area? Who are our competitors? Um, who's done a really good job of explaining this topic? Uh, what have they done that we could do better? Success in, in this particular industry is hard. I think, uh, you know, we're a relatively small company and we're competing against Nickelodeon and Disney and a lot of big companies. So, you know, how do you maximize the, the value of your company is, is, is really hard. The biggest competition that we have are these big companies that um, they create apps as marketing for some other entity. So if you are sort of a children's television network, 
and you have a character on there, you can create like little apps very cheaply. Um, and, and you're advertising on television. Um, you know, our business is making apps. If we're, that's our only business. We're not trying to sell something else. Um, so that's the really hard part of it, is, is getting discovered in that, in that market. Are building like these very rich, very you know educational at the same time, and you don't really see a lot of those paired together. Um, at least a lot of times, with you know the educational market, they're kind of they're not always like to the quality you you want them to be. Um, so I think we stand out in that sense. Our hope is to be a, a, a brand that is is grows to be big enough that that. Um, that we're recognized for ourselves. I mean, I, I come out of the film business where owning your IP, your intellectual property, uh, is sort of a core foundation. Um, and so we own everything that we do. Um, and again, we started from this idea of a very strong brand. So the hope is eventually we get to the point where people recognize the brand and, and, and want to buy into it. We want to be the good guys. We want to be an app company that just really emphasizes quality time, learning, um, no, no like polluting people's minds with um, garbage. I believe the keys to succeeding in this industry, at least as an individual, is find the thing that you really love to do. And I know it's, it's cliche, but if you find that one thing that you really like doing, you're going to put 110 effort, percent effort into it. and that's just going to show in your work and um, you know I think here at Tiny Bop we're all doing exactly what we love so it's something that really makes a difference. Definitely working at Tiny Bop is a dream job. I think we're we're at a pretty good place right now. Um, we're looking to kind of accelerate our development, uh, put out a few more apps like, at a greater rate than we are right now. Um, but I think we're, we're, we're doing pretty well where we are right now, and we just want to continue that. <laughs>